Some people can pray an hour. I'm doing it if I'm doing two minutes. Yeah. Let's take a moment. Let's pray. Let's dedicate our time to God as we celebrate Easter this morning. Father, thank you so much for what this day represents. Uh, Your son, back to life. Uh, We know that uh, as we reflected on Friday that uh, he laid down his life voluntarily for each one of us. He came here to earth for that purpose, for that reason. And as he was introduced to the world, his cousin labeled and named him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's, that's what Jesus came to do, and that's what he makes possible. For each one who will acknowledge what happened at the cross and what we are focusing on this morning with the resurrection of your son, came back to life not only to prove that he controls death and he controls life, but also as a very powerful demonstration that everything he said was true. And he did the impossible to back up life-changing words uh, from his mouth and from the scriptures that we lean on and rely on for strength and sustenance daily. So as we focus on the resurrection of Jesus and celebrate uh, what he did for us, it is with great gratitude and great thanksgiving. Uh, Father, we want to just demonstrate in a variety of ways how grateful we are for the depth of your love. You demonstrated in a way that uh, probably no human would do to give their son to uh, people who are distanced and broken and uh, in much need of love. And you did that. Thank you. We want to receive your love today and every day. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Are we up there and running there, Joshua? We're good? Okay. Sheila? Come on. You ready? Thank you so much, Sheila. Wonderful. I think we should start every service that way. Huh? I, I like, let's see if I can do this. Risen? So he's like buried and then standing alive. Okay, risen. And Jesus 
Christ. Okay, the nail prints. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sheila. Good. Well, I, not, <laughs> a duet. <laughs> yeah, I would sign out of tune if we did a duet. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> All right. Anyway, wonderful. Welcome to Cascadia Church. We welcome you on this Easter morning. It's so good to have all of you. And uh, very grateful for the hope that we have in Christ. So that's what our focus will be about here today. And I want to begin this way. If you have ever met someone that you were just very attracted to, and then the two of you fell in love, and you get married... You discover a kind of love that you didn't know existed until the two of you made that commitment to be husband and wife and to live together, until you began to share a unique kind of love and a unique kind of relationship. And then after you're married, if you have children, you discover a different kind of love. A kind of love that you did not know existed. And there is a depth of love that you did not know that you could have for anybody else until your children are born. It it is a game changer. I remember when my firstborn, Daniel, the day that he was born, uh, driving back to the apartment from the hospital in Fullerton, California, watching some road construction workers at the intersection, wondering, why don't you guys take the day off? Man, my son was just born. What's the matter with you guys? I I thought the whole world was going to stop revolving just for that guy. Yeah. And then if your children should grow up and they should get married, and they have children of their own, you experience a different kind of love. And you also discover again that you were not aware that you had the capacity to love someone so deeply. It just, does, it, it just gets better, doesn't it? It's just like, wow, so neat, so amazing. Well, I want to let you know, good morning, that uh, the love of God is unlike any kind of love shared among humans, whether it's a husband and wife, a parent and a child, or a parent and a grandchild. The love of God, unlike ours, is perfect. We're broken people. We're imperfect people. We love imperfectly. But God's love is perfect. God's love is limitless. And unlike some human relationships that don't make it, God is never going to change his mind about you. He never will. He'll never give up on you. He'll never leave you. Got an amen <laughs> from my grandson son that I love more deeply than I thought I could love anybody else. Yeah. God's love is perfect. His love for us. Uh, God's love, uh, it, it's, uh, he, he, he is never going to harm us. He's never going to rebel against us. He's never going to reject us. And uh, God's love, as I said just a moment ago, unlike every other kind of human love, his love is perfect. It's perfect for us. And God contributes to relationships with perfection. With perfection. He always offers his best. All the time. He always is available to listen. All the time. Uh, He never gets tired of listening to you. Others might. God never does. And once we begin uh, to experience the love of God, it takes more than a lifetime to understand it. And that's why I think eternity is so long, because even then, we're not going to be able to fully understand or comprehend the love of God. It's going to take eternity for us to fully grasp what it's like. And the, the infinite God love that God has for us is far deeper and stronger than my love for Joanne or for my kids Daniel, Joseph, Stephen, and Carissa. Or my grandkids, Emma, Hannah, Malachi, Asher, Cooper, Piper. His love is so, so much deeper than I have for my own family. My, the spouses of my children as well. They're, they're our kids also. 
And so this morning, I just want to show you, if I can, how Easter is anchored to the love of God. He is, as some say, he's not mad at us, he's mad about us. He is crazy about us. He loves us so much. I have a good friend. When uh, we correspond, email back and forth, he signs his name, and then he puts after that, God loves you so much. I thought, you know, that's true. I appreciate the reminder. It's a great reminder. And it's the, it's the love of God that caused Jesus to go to the cross. And it's the love of God that caused him to rise again uh, and to ascend into heaven and that will bring him back here to earth when he returns. And so before I talk about some more details and some more ideas about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I want to read the, the resurrection account from the Gospels. I'm in Luke chapter 24, you can turn, or 20, yeah, 23 actually. Uh, you can turn there if you'd like to in your Bible. So I'm going to pick up right after Jesus has died. He's still on the cross. And that's what Friday was about when we remembered his crucifixion. Well, we pick it up in uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 50. And there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action, which is to crucify Jesus. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was a day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. That's the preparation for the Passover. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how it was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered, delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. So I want to talk a little bit about the love of God, how it motivated Jesus to rise from the dead. And also, prior to that, of course, to give his life. So item number one is this. Jesus died for me because he loves me. He died for me because he loves me. John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus is speaking. And he says, no greater love, no greater love has no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. And so he is emphasizing here, he's talking about the depth of love that God has for humanity. And he's prophesying, Grandpa, yeah. He's prophesying about the degree to which God would go to demonstrate just how much he loves us. Jesus is anticipating the price that he is going to pay to make available to you and me an eternal relationship with God. Why? Because he loves us. There's no deeper, there's no stronger, there's no better love than this. It is, Jesus had to die because sin is what separates us from our creator. And there's a consequence for that separation. There's a remedy to that separation. And that remedy is for the sin that we have committed that separates us from God to be forgiven. And a price needs to be paid for that forgiveness. Forgiveness is not cheap. Grace is not cheap. And it was the, the, the death of God's own son that paid the price for you and me so that our sins could be forgiven. So Jesus took our sins to the cross, made forgiveness available. 
so that we can begin a love relationship with God that will never end. It will never end. Rarely does someone ever find themselves faced with a situation where they may or may not have to lay down their life for their friends. It's rare. Although it happens often in times of war or when violence is a threat or violence is a reality. I reflected again this week on the Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee and how the head of the school, Catherine Kuntz, laid down her life for her students, her friends. She heard the gunfire and she ran toward it to try to stop that problem and it cost her her life. That is so like Jesus, so like him. She did not hesitate to demonstrate her love. Romans chapter five, verse eight says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If I can just, without being sacrilegious, say while the bullets were still flying and we're aiming at God, Jesus said, I'm going to step in, intervene, and I'm going to fix this problem. And he did. He did. Even when we're separated from God. Some other verses say even when we're at war with God. He reached down. He reached out to draw us in so that we can share his love. 1 John chapter 3.16. You know John 3.16. Here's 1 John 3.16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for his friends. It was the love of Jesus that caused him to lay down his life for me. That's why he died. Because he loves me. He loves you. That's why he did it. So on the cross, Jesus demonstrated, I love you this much. That's what he did. And then he died. Second one, number two, Jesus rose for me because he loves me. He rose for me, rose from the dead because he loves me. Second Corinthians chapter five, beginning in verse 14. The love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose on their behalf. I want you to see this, the connection between the love of Christ and his death and his resurrection. It's there. Jesus went to the cross. He vacated the tomb because he loves us. And that kind of love will change your life when you receive it. Not just to know about it, but to know it. First 18 years of my life, I knew Jesus died on the cross for my sins. But it was not until I surrendered my life to Christ because of that, that that biblical truth traveled about a foot or so down to my heart. And as you'll see in just a moment, that's where Christ now lives. In my heart and in the hearts of many of you as well. I know this. See this here? It's the love of Christ that controls us. This is the demonstration of a changed life, changed by the love of Christ for us. You ever heard anybody say, stop trying to control me? Sometimes you hear that from, yeah, sometimes you hear that from children or sometimes maybe childish adults, uh, whatever it might be. But... Those of us who know the love of Christ and we know Christ personally, what we say instead is, please control me because without your love, I am out of control. Without your love, I'm out of control. I need your love to control me. And so because Jesus died for us, because he lives for us, we in turn want to live for him. And it's similar to something we saw recently here at Cascadia Church when we looked at the book of Galatians in the New Testament. It says this in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 
And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that makes it possible for this whole new way of living. I want you to see this. Christ lives in me. And the scriptures teach that we uh, symbolically die when we come to know Christ as our Savior. And it's, it indicates here in this verse. Do you see that second line? It's no longer I who live. Now, I'm still alive, yes, but I'm not in charge. I have in one of my Bibles uh, written in the margin, rip, rest in peace, Dan Lloyd, next to this verse, and I wrote down the day that I died when Christ became my Savior, and he, became, he began to live in me. This phrase here, we're going we're gonna to sing, uh, well, let me just back it up and say it this way. I, I want this to be true for you. I want this to be your life, that Christ lives in you. You know, sometimes we say that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, Greg would understand, having come from the UK, what lords and ladies and kings and queens and all those things are about. Here, in, on the other side of the pond, uh, I like to say the resident president. Christ lives in my life and he's in charge. It is a title of authority. Then we are under that authority. In a few moments, we're going to sing these lyrics. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. And I, I want you to be able to sing these words like you mean it. As though it's true for you. Because I want it to be true for you. There are many different religions around the world. But I wonder how many, I know how many, but it's more of a rhetorical question. I wonder how many founders of those different religions died for you and rose from the dead for you and live inside of you at the big fat goose egg or Easter egg. Okay, yeah. Nobody, only Jesus. Only Jesus could do that. We see in John 14, verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will follow my word and my father will love him. And notice this, we will come to him and make our dwelling within him. God's going to live inside your body. He's going to roll from your heart. Your heart becomes his throne. And when you say yes to Jesus Christ, you essentially get evicted from that throne. It's not your place. It's his. Excuse me, here's another one. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. I pray that Christ, notice this, may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you be rooted and grounded in love. Jesus is alive. It's the point of Easter. It's the point of every day for those who know Jesus. He rose for you so that he could live with you now in this life and forever in heaven. So Easter is not just about a new calendar season. It's about God's love for you demonstrated through his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection. And he's going to demonstrate it again when he returns and when we spend eternity with him. Do you remember when you were younger, trying to figure out what love looks like? You, you, you maybe felt, knew what it felt like. I had a prof in seminary who said, love is a feeling you feel when you feel like you're going to get a feeling that you've never felt before. <laughs> it's the way a lot of people operate. But when you're younger, I, I hope you did this. I hope it's not just me. <laughs> you, you got these flowers, and you're wondering if your crush loves you. She loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. No, Dennis, she never did that. Try it, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, depending on how it ends up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Here's the thing. Once you discover the love of God, everything changes, including trying to figure out whether or not God loves you. Because what you'll do is you'll pick up a flower and you'll go, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me. Because it's true. And it's his love that changes us. If we believe that, if we know that Christ died and rose from the dead for us because he loves us, the Bible says, you are saved. Let me show you the verse and I'll tell you what it means. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord or resident president and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What does it mean to be saved? From what are we saved? Well, from the, um, the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, the consequences of sin, which is eternal separation from God. We get to live with him now and forever. Now and forever. So there, there's two big events that we love to celebrate as a church. Easter is one, Christmas is another. And when the angel told Joseph that Mary was carrying inside of her body the Son of God, the angel said this to Joseph, she will give birth to a son and you shall name him Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. That's why he came to earth. To save us from the power and the penalty of sin. Someday we'll be released from the presence of sin, but right now we struggle. It's not easy. But we can be victorious. It's another sermon for another time. Forgiveness means this, that we've been freed, as I said, from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and you can have that today. You can have that today. You can receive a fresh start. This new kind of life that that comes with no regrets. Scripture says that those who believe in Jesus will never be disappointed. Never in him. Maybe with ourselves. Maybe with one another, but never with him. And that our life will be filled with hope. And so what we want for you, what I want for you this morning is to say yes to the love of God to say yes to what Jesus did for you at the cross because he loves you, to say yes to what Jesus did in that tomb as he came back to life and vacated that cross because he loves you, then he's coming back because he loves you and he wants to be with you physically forever. He wants to be in your life now throughout eternity. So every week here at Cascadia Church, I put up a little takeaway. And uh, the takeaway, my suggestion for this week is just simply, he loves me. He loves me. If you don't get anything else, get that. That's so important. It's so foundational. Concluding verse, 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. This is our prayer. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God. We want you to find that. We want you to find him. We want you to know him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us far beyond what we can know or comprehend. We thank you that your love is perfect, it's eternal. Your son promised he'd never leave us or forsake us. And now we know how and why that's true. It's because he dwells in our hearts. And we thank you for that. We thank you that Easter made that possible. That Jesus overcame death, he conquered death, he came back to life. Who does that? Only Jesus. And he offers us the same kind of life where there will be no end. He demonstrated that for us and makes it available to anyone who will say yes. Father, would you open hearts and and give to each person the capacity to say yes to Jesus. Father, I say yes to what Christ did for me at the cross. Because he loves me, he took my sin with him there. All the things that I've done that I shouldn't have done, all the things I should have done that I didn't do, and everything that's coming up, you covered it all through your son. 
when he took my sin to the cross. And he died and he was buried and he rose from the dead to prove that he conquered death. He is the author of life and he gives life, eternal life, to all who believe. Father, I believe. I receive your love. I say yes to your love today. And I do so in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's say goodbye to our friends who are watching. And then I'll have the music team come up and we're going to sing for a little bit, okay? Thanks.